It's with our fantasy that we first meet the unknown, right? Well, look, say you're going out with a new person. It's like, what do you do? You project a fantasy on them. And then you fall in love with the fantasy. And aren't you stupid? Because you're going to find out that the <laughs> match between your damn fantasy and the actual person is tenuous at best. And so Jung would call that a, a projection of either the anima or the animus. You know, the anima is what a man projects onto a woman he finds desirable. It's like, oh, she's the perfect woman. It's like, well, how do you know that? You've like seen her for four seconds, you know, but it grips you. And the same thing happens in the opposite direction. And it's an action of instinct, you know, it's like you fall in love with the image. And, but uh, interestingly enough, what you do in a relationship that works is that you actually, I think that what you see, it's a rough approximation, when you project the ideal and fall in love with it, you see what could be. It could be that, but it's going to take you a hell of a lot of work because like, you got no shortage of flaws and the other person has no shortage of flaws and so you're bringing your flaws together and that's going to produce a lot of friction and you're going to have to engage in a lot of dialogue before you approach that level of perfection again but maybe you can do it and then you get to live happily ever after well wouldn't that be nice well, so the unconscious meets the unknown and it, it meets it with imagination and fantasy and dream and art. That's how you take... See, you don't just go from what you don't know to fully articulated knowledge in one bloody leap. You can't do that. You have to extend pseudopods of fantasy and imagination into the unknown. That's kind of what theorizing is like, right? Even scientifically, you know, you don't know something scientifically, you generate a theory. Well, it's an imaginative representation that your unconscious is helping you generate. And so you meet the unknown with fantasy. That's what the unconscious is for. From the psychoanalytic perspective, that's what dreams do. And you can see why you dream about the future. You know, it's like, well, what's the future going to be like? Well, you have a little imaginative story going on and it's like, you don't really create it. It's sort of, you watch it unfold. You know, maybe you can tweak it here and there, but it sort of comes to you from wherever the hell things like that come from. You know, the unconscious, that's the psychoanalytic answer. It's not really much of an answer because it's more like a representation of a, f of a place that we don't understand. But that's where creativity comes from. And I mean, some people are really creative right down to the bloody core. So in my clinical practice, I often see people who are high in openness because they're attracted to me because they watch my lectures. And you have to kind of be high in openness to like my lectures. So because, well, you do, because they go everywhere, you know, and, and they're not necessarily very orderly. So, um, so anyways, lots of my clients are really high in openness and they're funny people often, especially if they're smart, because sometimes they have the most nihilistic intelligence you can imagine. It's just self-critical and nihilistic and brutally brutal, man, and smart. And so they just criticize themselves out of existence. And so often I have to just try to get them to quit listening to their chattering ra self-critical rationality and go out and create something, you know, with their massive creativity. And as long as they're doing that, they're engaged in the world and happy as hell. But as soon as that self-critical rationality comes in and shuts down the creativity, they're just, they're just like walking corpses, you know. And it's because if you're really open, like that's, you're a tree and it, it has some trunks and, you know, your, your most prominent trait is the most lively trunk. And if you're a creative person and you're not engaging in a creative enterprise, you're just, you're like a tree that, that has been, you're, that has had its vitality amputated. And so this is not trivial. This stuff is, this is deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in your biology. And, and those are people often who have, like dream lives you just can't believe. I have one client, he has like four spectacular dreams a week and most of the time we just spend discussing them. He, and I had another client who could be lucid in her dreams, which is more common among women. She could ask the damn characters what they represented and they would tell her. It was like, <laughs> okay, that was pretty weird. And like a lot of the things they told her were really helpful and they were not things that she wanted to hear. She, she basically... One of them told her she, if she was going to live, she'd have to go visit a slaughterhouse. And the reason for that was because she was raised as a little princess and protected from horrible mother nature 
until she hit puberty, in which time she turned into an evil villain, because that's how the family worked. Perfect child, evil teenager, overnight. And then, well, that was hard on her, and she wasn't prepared because she thought the world was princess world, and, you know, she couldn't go through a butcher store without having a fit, and no wonder, you know, it's, it's no wonder, but you do it. But she couldn't, so we used to go to butcher stores, and that would make her cry, and, and um, that she was a vegetarian, that would make her cry, and, you know, bemoan the cruelty of the world, and it's like, yeah, fair enough, man, those are bloody slabs of meat. It's like, I don't know why everyone isn't screaming when they walk through the butcher store, but, but you got to get used to it, man, because you can't live in the world otherwise. And so, the dream character, who was a gypsy, told her that she had to go visit a slaughterhouse, which seemed rather impractical, and so I asked her if she could think of anything else to do, and she thought, well, why don't we go visit a funeral home and, and watch an embalming? And I thought, oh, good. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds like a fun way to spend a day. And so I phoned up a funeral parlor, and I said I had a client who was terrified of death. Yeah, <laughs> and I was a therapist who was also a little shaky on the concept myself. <laughs> And so they, they had no problem with that. And they deal with death all the time, which is really something to think about, right? A human being can actually have an occupation where they do nothing but deal with death and they don't go stark raving mad. It's like, what the hell's up with that? It's like working in a palliative care ward where your, your clients that you, you know, have a relationship, all they're going to do is die this week, next week, the week after. People do that. It's like, those people are tough, man. They're tough. So anyways, we went and watched this embalming, which was, I have a rather high level of disgust sensitivity, so it, it was a little on the rough side for me. But she sat there, and first while she was not, we were outside this little room, she was not looking at that man, no way. Then she'd kind of go like this, and you know, that was pretty good, and then she'd go like this, and then she'd go like this, and then, then she watched it. And then she asked if she could go in and she put on a glove and she touched the body and she didn't have a fit, she didn't have a panic attack and so she walked away from there learning that there was a hell of a lot more to her than she thought there was and that she could see things that she didn't think she could see and live. And after that she sort of had a touchstone. It's like, well I'm kind of afraid of this. Well is it as bad as going to see the embalming? No, it's not that bad. Well, I guess I can do it. It's like an initiation, right? She had an initiation, and so did I, you know. And I learned a lot from doing that. I learned that one of the things you need to do if you're going to be a human being is to prepare yourself to be useful in the face of death.